May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be free from harm. May all beings love life. May all beings awaken. Welcome to another Cuke Audio Podcast. I pray that you and yours are safe and comfortable, free from economic hardship, and able to get out and do whatever it is you want within the limitations of the universal precept of do as little harm as possible. So today, we're going to have the second podcast reading the Chronicles of the Haiku Zendo. So yesterday, we just read the um, introduction and acknowledgments. So uh, today, we read the origins. No, the Haiku Zendo in Los Altos, California, is where uh, Shunyu Suzuki gave uh, the lectures that were used, that comprised Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. And uh, it was a great group. It was a great group. And it's called Haiku Zendo. (gasps) You're going to learn about that in this. I'm not going to spoil it. All right, origins. In January 1971, in a ceremony performed by Shunyu Suzuki Roshi, Les K was ordained a Zen Buddhist monk at Haiku Zendo. Suzuki Roshi was assisted by Kobun Chino Sensei and Dainin Katagiri Sensei, as they were then called. What, what they mean by that is later it was Gobunjino Roshi and Dani Gadagiri Roshi. After the ceremony, there was a reception in the house. Roshi was a bright center of light in his yellow silk robes. Some students asked Roshi how it all started here on the peninsula. He said that years ago he had visited friends in Redwood City, and felt that this area would be a good place to teach. Not long after that, the first meeting place was arranged in Palo Alto. That was the beginning. Roshi's happy smile included all that had happened since then, especially the first ordination at Haiku Zendo. Les Kay's ordination was to be the last time Roshi was at Haiku Zendo, He died the following December. Fortunately, this possibility was far from our minds that day, and nothing marred the occasion. To begin this short history of Haiku Zendo, we must turn to Marion Derby's Haiku Zendo Annual Report, 1969. Marion writes, Timber Cat, who was then a senior at Stanford University, remembers the origins of the Peninsula Branch of the San Francisco Zen Center as a remark by Reverend Suzuki that if a meeting place could be found in the Peninsula, he would like to begin a weekly meditation group. Tim contacted a Stanford graduate student who agreed to let the group use his living room. Tim sent postcards to people on the Windbell mailing list who lived in the area, and early in November 1964, the first Zazen and lecture was held at 1005 Bryant Street in Palo Alto. Tim remembers that there were only three or four who attended the first few meetings. All right, that's the end of Marion's comment there. Between February 1965 and June 1965, the following people began to attend the Palo Alto meetings regularly. Gladys Halpern, Marion Derby, Gertrude Davenport, Tim Burkett, Philip Wilson, Helen Donahue, Bob Randall, Dan Beatty, and Tony Johansson. 
That's T-O-N-I Johansson, Antoinette, because her husband was T-O-N-Y. And he started sitting there, too. Gertrude Davenport describes the situation of the morning group in 1965 as follows. When I first went to sit in June 1965, it was in the living room of the old Kimball house in Palo Alto. That house was then a boarding house for men students from Stanford. There was a Japanese man, can't remember his name, who lived in the house and sat with us. After a short while, he moved away to San Francisco. We were then using the living room, but nobody who lived in the house was sitting with us. Roji said, This is not fair to the people in the house. We must move from here. Shortly after, the Thursday morning meetings moved to Marion's house in Los Altos. Quite often in later years, newcomers to the group would ask us if there was a religious significance <laughs> in the choice of Thursday as a meeting day. Tim Burkett explained as follows. When Suzuki Roshi talked to him of establishing a weekly meeting in the peninsula, Roshi's schedule was not particularly crowded. Tim was asked to name the day. Tim hurriedly reviewed the class schedule at Stanford. Thursday was his light day. So, and so Thursday it was, and Thursday it remained. For an account of the evening group in Redwood City, we turn to Marion Derby's 1969 report. On April 21st, 1965, the first meeting of the evening group was held at the home of Amy Simpson, who lived at 849 Palm Street in Redwood City. Zazen began at 7.30 p.m. No ceremony was held. After Zazen, Reverend Suzuki lectured on the Platform Sutra. Wow! Listen, I want to say something about the platform. Sutra. That's the Weening's um, Six Patriarchs Sutra. Um, it's called Sutra. You know, it's not really a sutra. I mean, it's sutra in a, a liberal use of the term sutra, which originally means, you know, a record of words spoken by Buddha. Um, uh, Suzuki told me that um, when we were... Uh, working on, um, when I was studying the Sando guy while he was lecturing on it, and the echo, the chants after the chants, <laughs> the chants done by a single person uh, offering the merit of the chant. Uh, he gave talks on our various echoes that we used. Uh, he said next he wanted to talk about the Platform Sutra. He thought that was the greatest thing out of China. I mean, that's what it seemed like he was saying. I mean, he spoke very highly out of it. Um, but that was 1970, and, and uh, you know, he was planning on doing that when he came back in 71. But um, he, he uh, you know, he, he sort of thought he might not have another, another summer there. So he just lectured uh, extemporaneously that summer before he died. Anyway, back to the origins. At about 9.15, tea and cookies were served and questions were answered. Four students attended this meeting. Tony Johansson, Amy Simpson, myself, and a young man who drove Reverend Suzuki from San Francisco. This group grew to 17 people and then dropped to an average of 8 to 10. With two or three exceptions, the evening group during 1965 and 1966 consisted of people who did not attend the morning group. Marion Derby's report records the move of the Thursday morning group to Los Altos as follows. On June 8th, 
1965, the morning group moved to my home at 746 University Avenue in Los Altos. Reverend Suzuki felt that we should expand our activities by holding our meetings in the home of one of the members. My living room was large, and my home was centrally located. One of the first additions to our activities was an informal breakfast after lecture. Coffee, fruit, and rolls were served in the dining room, and the family-like discussions around the breakfast table became almost as popular as the lectures. As Roy Henning has written, Certainly, Marion Derby looms very large in the history of Haiku Zendo. Her warmth made my entry and subsequent attendance at the Zendo a very memorable experience. In 1965, the Thursday morning schedule at Los Altos was as follows. 5.45 a.m. Zazen. 6.25, service, 6.45, lecture, 7, breakfast, 15 minutes for lecture. Oh, I'll tell you those. <laughs> he wasn't giving 15-minute talks. Some of those are pretty short. Yeah, those, those talks are pretty short, but I bet he answered questions or something. I, I don't really know. I did drive him there and go to some talks. I just can't remember. The evening group, too, moved to Marion's house in Los Altos. The following in Marion's account of this move. In February of 1966, the evening group moved from Redwood City to my home in Los Altos. Perhaps because of the move, this group has had fewer steady members. Even though it attracted more new members than the morning group, the custom of serving tea and refreshments after the lectures was continued. This is no longer Miriam. After the evening group moved to Los Altos, the consolidation of the two groups at one location was accomplished. Eventually, the evening meeting was to become very popular and continues to enjoy a large attendance. Now, this is written in 1973. In contrast to the, his morning talks, which were seldom more than 15 minutes, all right? Roshi used to talk at length in the evening. Some evening lectures went as late as 11, <laughs> 11 p.m. Oh, my God. Eager as we were to learn from him, some of us found ourselves dozing occasionally. No one seemed to mind. The schedule for the evening meeting was as follows. 7. Zazen. 7.40. Service. 8. Lecture. 9. <laughs> tea and discussion. What? He gave a three-hour talk? I never saw him do that. <laughs> Maybe the talk... And then he'd ask for questions and we'd just go on. And then they'd have tea at 10.30 or something. I can't believe he'd be talking to them. Some of the, she says some of his evening lectures when it's late is 11 p.m. Wow. Okay. That is the origins. Uh, Tim Burkett has written about this, too. And I'll tell you what, when I'm through reading this, I'll... Um, I'll read you uh, pieces out of Tim Burkett's book. Nothing holy about it. The Zen of being just who you are. Stories, koans, poems, and memories of my extraordinary teachers. Yeah, nothing holy about it. He was with uh, Junior Suzuki and then with Dining Katagiri. And um, edited by Wanda Isle. Okay, you know, I could do that. I think I might go over Tim's book. Um, it's got some good stuff in it. He was at Tassara, the first practice, period. Uh, and he's... he's. Um, I was just talking to Norman... to Norm Randolph in Minneapolis this morning for this week's guest. 
and he said Tim is like uh, semi-retired as habit of the Minneapolis Zen Center. Anyway, and you notice how Marion called Suzuki Reverend Suzuki. Um, uh, he was called. The older students called him Reverend Suzuki or Suzuki Sensei, and there was he was sometimes referred to as Suzuki Roshi, but nothing was decided until Alan Watts wrote a letter in 19, it was received in the fall of 1966, saying reverend is not the right term for him and you're using the word wrong. And anyway, that's not what you call Zen teachers. He said, you should call him Suzuki Roshi. So uh, it sort of became a thing after that. Everybody called him Suzuki Roshi and Roshi. Some of the old students, though, would call him sensei or reverend. There's people who came after that who, well, I can think of one person in particular who calls him Reverend Suzuki. I th I think he's doing it because he identifies with some of the early students, and I don't know, he just likes the feel of it. Um, I'm the opposite. Reverend is not my favorite uh honorific for people. <laughs> I don't like to use, you might notice I don't use honorifics. I, I avoid them uh, as much as possible. Um, if somebody else is using them and I'm reading it, I'll read they said it. I mean, at this point, who, you, you just, I just have to call everybody I know Roshi. Okay, thank you very much for joining us, and we will continue with the exciting reading of the Haiku Zendo Chronicles. It still hasn't said why it's called Haiku Zendo. I'll tell you if it doesn't tell. Okay, thank you very much. This has been a Cuke Audio Podcast. I'm DC Puba of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives, coming to you from Sleepy Sonur with Dog and Bandita, Feline Kujita, and Dear Lovely Katrinka, and Mudik, the plumber electrician who just arrived. I can hear him downstairs with our little guest dog, Bumble, barking at him. Fare thee well. Oh yeah, we're wishing you and yours and all of us a grand awakening. <laughs>